All right, I guess we can get started here. So um, today we have Allie, um, and she is going to be giving a presentation on the battle to address mobile and the endpoint security. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Barb, for that introduction. Um, as Barbara was saying, I'm going to be talking about the battle to address mobile in the endpoint security space. So the main things that we're going to talk about today are the need to respect mobile, um, the importance of education, both around security and on mobile, and how important convenience is to end users. A little about me, my name is Ali Mellon. Um, this picture was taken six years ago now at Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference when I was in college. Um, at the time, I was getting a degree in computer engineering and writing iOS apps about education and teaching people to code for iOS. So all of my roots are in development. Um, my favorite language is always going to be Objective-C. Sorry, Swifties. A couple years after this, I did some security research and became an engineering consultant. And now I write about uh, security at Cyber Reason. Back when this was taken, I wasn't worried about security at all. Developing iOS apps was very easy, very accessible. There's a lot of tutorials online. Security, not, the, not so much. <laughs> security is a very different piece. And I really wasn't alone. This is a pervasive issue, even with financial institutions who have recognized the importance of security and have even started implementing it. For a lot of developers, this is what security ends up looking like. It's just, it's not accessible. And sometimes it doesn't even make a lot of sense. Even the review process can be really frustrating. This is for a couple of reasons. The first has to do with deadlines and development shortcuts. Developers are focused on competitive features, not necessarily security. They're forced to move fast and their success metrics are all about features. Your goal is to put out code, but that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be secure code. The second one is platform familiarity. Mobile platforms don't have the same broad standardization that desktops do. Some, you don't need very much knowledge of the platform to use it. Others, like I specialized in iOS exclusively. I dabbled a little in Android, but it wasn't very much. And so it, there's a big mix as to what mobile developers, what type of experience mobile developers have with the platform. And unfortunately, some just don't underst understand the platform enough to keep security in mind. The next one is not to blame end users, but security really needs to be simple. And how are you going to approach the problem if the developers don't understand it, let alone the end users who have no experience with it? And the last one is legacy code, which sounds a bit crazy because smartphones are so new, but legacy code is still an issue. I wouldn't want to be a new Swift developer coming into a half Swift, half Objective-C project. So that's a little on the difficulties on the developer side. And now we're gonna get into the endpoint security space side. This may seem obvious to developers, but a genuine question in the endpoint security space is what even is mobile? What counts as mobile? A laptop is mobile but most people don't consider it to be a mobile device. Does the Internet of Things count as mobile? And how do you really decide how to define it and then secure it? And this gets even more complex when you consider that there's a lot of marketing that makes you believe that mobile phones are secure. Apple runs ads like this. What happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. But is that the reality? Take the Google Zero Day that they found last year. They had five unique exploit chains across iOS 10 to 12. They found 14 different vulnerabilities in iPhones, and they were ultimately able to install a monitoring implant onto these devices. That doesn't sound like Apple is living up to this marketing promise. There's some really important data and access points on a mobile device. The majority of mobile devices have 
corporate assets and personal assets. And basically what it comes down to is you have this device that's on you all the time that has a microphone, a camera, a GPS, and an accelerometer. It's like a spy's dream. So there, I think that there's a raise hand functionality. <laughs> How many of you have corporate data on your mobile device right now? I certainly do with this remote work situation that we're all dealing with. <laughs> it's convenient, um, especially as we have to deal with this new environment where we're almost likely working from home. So it's really not surprising how many devices have access to enterprise data. And it really screams the need for enterprises to respect mobile as an equal citizen when it comes to needing security. Enterprises are allowing it because what's the alternative? But that means that they're trying to defend something that they didn't even issue. It's all about convenience and you don't want your employees necessarily to have a work phone and a personal phone. Things are going to get mixed up. There's going to be cross contamination. So it really brings businesses to this issue way back when there was the concept of the business IT perimeter. Everything that IT and security teams had to defend was inside the enterprise. We just had to deal with workstations, which stayed at the office. Then came laptops. The perimeter was still mostly contained, but we have more and more options to potentially take a device outside of the business perimeter. But here we are with mobile devices, which have enterprise data on them and travel around with you constantly. It's a very different risk. But that's not even where we're at today, especially with the pandemic and with everyone having to self isolate. We've reached this point. One could say that we've reached the point where there's virtually no perimeter anymore. IT and security teams have to address mobile, they have to address laptops, they have to address things that are outside of the typical IT perimeter. And they really have to understand the scope of the problem, especially when you consider that it really is bring your own devices. There are more bring your own devices on an enterprise network than any other. And the way that they've traditionally secured it was through things like mobile device management, which is just IT management of devices. And it really can't do everything. It isn't designed to look for malware and to detect malware. And so that's leading to this recognition from enterprises of a larger threat that they're facing. And enterprise professionals are starting to really truly recognize that it's an issue and that they can't just be faced with MDM, they have to have something else. So let's look at these threats. I box them into four different categories. The first is user behavior. The second is application threats. We've got device threats and network threats. And we're going to go into these with some quick examples, just to give a glimpse into some of the problems. So user behavior, again, not necessarily the user's fault. We have to make security and apps and everything that we do has to be easy for the user. Convenience is king. Um, we can break this down into things like breaking policy or using a corporate device for personal use or clicking on a malicious link. Enterprise users are three times more likely to fall for a phishing link on a small screen like a mobile device. So where are these phishing attacks coming from? Because the majority of people think that they're from emails, phishing emails. And when you look at the stats, most emails are actually opened on a mobile device first. So now you're compounding the issue. The place where you're more likely to fall for a phishing attack is where these emails are first opened. But the question is, is that actually where phishing is the worst? And the answer is no. And this is what I mean about educating. Endpoint security and seemingly the larger, excuse me, the larger and more general population think that phishing attacks come from emails, but that's not what it's about for mobile. The reality looks different and we have to 
update our perspective as our technology updates, especially when it comes to developers who are making apps that hackers will be looking to leverage. A great example of this is texts. I actually just got a text today. This wasn't it. This was a different time, but <laughs> I actually just got a text today trying, there was a phishing link. They're making use of it more and more because it feels so accessible to just click on the link. Oh, they have my photos or, oh, they're offering me a discount. I get texts from CVS. I can't imagine if someone pretended to be CVS and sent me a link. Of course, I'm going to click on that. I want to see if my prescription's ready. The second thing we're going to look at is app threats. So app threats can look like things like elevated permissions, malicious apps, enterprise apps with poor coding practices, and they can lead to a hacker taking over a device by leveraging an insecure app, whether the app is malicious or not. So what's important about this is this is why it really matter matters for developers to get security right is because they're putting their users at risk if they don't. So we're going to divide this into legitimate apps and malicious apps, but we'll start with legitimate ones, even though the smiley face I know is a bit creepy. So a lot of apps have access to things that they don't need. As a developer, from my experience, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. It comes down to convenience. Take what you can get, and it might be useful later. Do 39% of apps really need to access the microphone? And you may be thinking, what does this really matter? But here's the reality. If a developer creates an app with insecure coding practices and they ask for access permissions, then they're putting you at risk. An app that asks for the microphone when they don't actually need it leaves the user open to being listened in on. But it goes even deeper than that. 90% of Android apps request full network access, which isn't needed for normal connectivity. And 12% of Android apps request access to modify system settings. Again, it's just a convenience thing. Just ask for it just in case. And the question becomes like, what do you see hackers doing with it? If they recognize that this app is not following best practices already, and then they're able to gain access. If they can get full network access, they can use your device to send malware to others. Their devi your device becomes their tool. So a really great resource that I found is OWASP. They're the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a nonprofit that works to improve the security of software. And um, it's a great source for developers that want to secure the web and mobile applications. And these are the top 10 ways cyber criminals compromise mobile apps. They're the most important things as developers to keep in mind. And you know, it doesn't just happen with apps that are attacked. For example, Xcode Ghost is a version of Xcode that could be downloaded online that injects third-party code into apps that are compiled with it. Over 4,000 legitimate applications were infected with this. The solution is to take security seriously, use genuine software, not knockoffs or pirated copies. Now let's look at malicious apps. 17 different apps made it on the iOS app store, which is supposed to be very restrictive that communicated with a hidden server that a hacker was controlling using the um, particularly used ad fraud. And they're not the only ones. What's even worse is these apps, they're not just looking to get on the device, they want to expand. And when you consider that they want to expand, automatically my mind goes to the enterprise. So say it's a 100 to a 250 device company, a pretty small company, all things considered. There's a 5% likelihood of of, that a single device is infected, which could impact the rest of your network. But when you get up to a 10,000 person company, 
it's a 97% likelihood that at least one is infected. And all it takes is one. So for larger enterprises, it's just a reality that someone is compromised in their organization. Next up is devices, devices going missing or not updating the operating system. So 57% <laughs> of Android devices are two OSs behind. This equates to 507 known vulnerabilities, known vulnerabilities per device, with nearly two thirds of those rated critical or high risk. This is a huge, easily preventable threat. And really, this is where MDM is. This is something that's really important about having MDM. The last one is things like public Wi Fi, where you end up exposing your credentials to. All the devices you connect to. 80% of employees use public Wi-Fi for work even when it's banned. It's even easier to do it on a mobile device. Just join that local Starbucks Wi-Fi. And 70% of Wi-Fi sessions were over an unencrypted connection. We can't force people to respect mobile. Telling them don't do that isn't working. Would you join these without a second thought? Everything is just more accessible on mobile. It doesn't feel wrong to join a random Wi-Fi network like it does on a laptop, potentially. We've been conditioned to think it's safe. All those marketing messages, all of that. I'd especially join that last one. <laughs> Unencrypted Wi-Fi connections can leave your credentials open to attackers. Fake hotspots can leave you at their mercy and they can also use these connections to sit um, sit in on you and listen to your communications through a man in the middle attack. So that was a brief overview of mobile threats, but now we're gonna get into the implications, especially for enterprises. First off, there are two things I immediately think of when it comes to a good target. The first is easily sensitive data on the device. You can just set that aside. And then the second is an, the entry point into the enterprise. It's basically the server that is somewhere no one knows about that leaves an entry point into your network that gets hacked, except every single person that works for you has one. And it leads us back to that stat on 57% of Android users being two versions behind in the operating system. AKA 57% of Android users actually are the server somewhere that no one knows about. So first, sensitive data. What type of sensitive data do you have available right now? Usernames, passwords, credit card info, social security number, health data, pictures of your cat. It's all a target for attackers. But it really goes deeper than that because a lot of people and a lot of programs by default now use two-factor authentication. But say an attacker is able to gain access to your phone. They get the credentials for your corporate email. They go to log in to your account, but oh, I have two-factor authentication. They can't do anything with this, except they own your phone, which is where most two-factor authentication goes back to. So they still own your account. So let's talk about a typical scenario that an enterprise might face from a defender's point of view, a security analyst. You're an analyst, you get an alert. An attack has made it past your prevention. You start to investigate and you identify the target machine, which is a workstation. It looks like they were trying to exfiltrate data. You find the malware has done some lateral movement, some other behaviors going on too. They're communicating with the server, the attacker controls. But how they got in, you have no idea. The security team is lost with the tools they have. They can't find the root cause. One of the most important things in security is having the visibility and the understanding to stop these threats as they happen. And the reason they can't find it is because it's Joe's iPhone and they don't have any visibility into any mobile device that's on the network. 
they have no way of detecting this. And that's scary because it's the black hole of blind spots. It's a huge blind spot for everyone. You can't respond to the things that you can't detect. There's no visibility into the entryway, so you can't patch the hole and you're in trouble. But the question is, what other more complex avenues does this bring up? And we're going to tie it back to the phishing attack. You're in the finance department and you get this email from your CEO. They need funds transferred yesterday and you're finding out just now that they think that you dropped the ball. Now, these types of emails still fool some people, but overall people are starting to understand and have the awareness around this risk and choose to confirm through calling or texting before making any transfers. But before you can do that, you get a text message again from your CEO. Little did you know, attackers gained access to your mobile device weeks ago. They set up a fake contact to look like the CEO and bam, they have legitimacy. Who isn't going to send the money now? They're going to trust their phone as a secondary means of authentication. But even if they don't, you take it a step further and you call the target from a phone that you've labeled as the CEO. You can either use a deep fake to clone their voice or just like leave no message and just hang up when they answer. At this point, the person in finance is panicked. They're going to transfer the funds as quickly as they can because <laughs> they really think they're in trouble. So now we get the problem, but how do we address it? We're going to talk about how we address it again with in the endpoint security space, but also for developers. So first, take mobile seriously. Enterprises need to start taking mobile seriously, which they're just starting to do. We're seeing mobile threat detection become more and more important, and soon it's gonna be equally important to traditional endpoint detection. By this year, mobile malware should account for a third of total malware. That's huge. It's best to take it seriously now instead of after an incident. And this means educating. This means security people educating developers, security people educating end users, developers, educating security people. It needs to be a collaborative effort. Everyone needs to be an advocate for this stuff because it affects our privacy and our private data. And don't reinvent the pyramid. This is a lesson from the endpoint security space. It's just because mobile seems foreign doesn't mean that it is. And the same thing with security. I think it's really important um, to keep in mind things like using the OWASP as a resource, using MITRE ATT&CK. MITRE ATT&CK is a company, a, no, a nonprofit that works with companies on their security. They have a whole framework for um, categorizing mobile attacks as well as traditional endpoint attacks. And of course, to work with IT. IT owns mobile device management. So security teams definitely have to work with IT if they're going to control mobile threat detection and developers should too, especially if your corporation has an application that, the develop that your team has built. So last thing is to make it easy for the developers, the end users and the security people. We need productive communication. We need tools that people can take advantage of and to for developers, it's to take a security first mindset and to recognize that even though it seems like a rabbit hole, it's not too deep and it's achievable to even do the bare minimum to prevent mobile attacks. So let's talk about this a little bit more. The first thing the developers can do is use the tools that companies give you. And always 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 use the legitimate software please do not use pirated software to create things that people are going to use and put their personal information in the second is to take advantage like i said of OWASP take advantage of the tools that are already created in the industry and also just consider hiring a security developer to help you out worst comes to worst <laughs> 
So closing with some thoughts on the future. Some security people get stuck trying to fix a hole, but they're on a boat that's in the ocean and they can't stop the water from coming in. Security needs to go beyond security people, beyond the like people who are obsessed with security. We need to extend to the developers and we should use mobile as a blueprint for whatever comes next, whether it's IoT or something else. This is our blueprint to secure devices better in the future and to fight off attackers better in the future. Um, again, my name is Ellie Mellon. Thank you guys for attending. Thank you to Nerd. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. doesn't look like any questions. Um, thank you guys. This is great. Looks like there's one question there. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, have you heard much about IoT in security? Great question. Um, yes and no. IoT devices are notoriously insecure. Um, it's I think that it's something that's like reaching critical mass right now for security people. There are some security vendors out there who claim that they do IoT security, but it's the issue has a lot of complexity. And oftentimes it ties back into things like um, critical infrastructure providers and systems that have IoT devices in them and it has like huge number of regulations around the industry. So yes and no, um, people are trying to start securing it, but I think that we haven't reached that tipping point yet where that's everything, like all the security vendors are trying to get into that industry yet. It's also kind of complex because we struggle with things like updating, um, updating IoT devices. Anyone else? How to let companies take endpoint security more seriously without compromising convenience? Great question. <laughs> um, endpoint security is a commitment and you have to, there are a lot of vendors out there that say that they can provide you with endpoint security that's not going to affect your end users. Um, I think that you have to find a vendor that works for your specific needs. That's the thing. And different people need security products that are much better in certain ways. And maybe some just want ones that like will not affect the business and certain vendors are just known for that. Unfortunately, there's really no way to completely take that out of the equation. But there's a certain level where you can justify the inconvenience for the security that it brings. And a lot of that comes from education too. How can we be sure we're safe using our mobile devices when our everyday apps could be compromised? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. Security is about managing risk. 
there's no way that you can be sure that you're safe, which is one of the most frustrating things for people about security. Um, there's just ways to reduce risk. That's the most important thing that you can do is to reduce risk. So for example, what I do is I try to use apps and work with companies that take that I know take security seriously, that have bug bounty programs, that are very transparent about their security practices and their coding conventions and how they handle all of that. Also, any vendor who says, we take your security seriously, that makes me panic a little bit. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, because that usually means that they, that they don't really know what they're talking about, to be honest. Um, but if you can look at a vendor, there's a lot of transparency around what they do. They are clear about the security practices that they use, and they seem to be aware of the fact that there's no way to be 100% sure. That's usually a really good sign that they take it seriously and that they are doing everything they can to reduce that risk. So it just comes to talking, talking to the application developers. Any other questions? Um, hi, is my mic okay or? I'm fine with it. Is that okay? Uh yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Um, just thank you for your presentation. I really, I really liked it. It was like really well put together. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Ksenia. Uh, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you too. Yeah. Um, I had another little question. Yeah. So, public schools, um, are they more? at risk to attacks than say an everyday company like with kids like you know downloading every single kind of app they can get right are the networks more at risk or it really depends on the school and the company of course um right. i think that something that um is very interesting in that i'm actually researching right now is there's a trend um, with like government organizations in particular and that can include things like public schools where they're investing more money in things like cyber insurance than they are in the actual tools to defend against a cyber attack um, and that is a shift from companies who tend to invest more because they they need to invest for public trust they'll invest in the security tools to prevent the attacks more than the insurance to recover from the attacks. So I think that uh, perhaps the mindset in many instances is different and that does lend itself to um, higher risk in public schools and with government organizations to a certain extent, like local government, medium government. Why do they do that if they're, you know, risking their data and whatnot? Um, Spending on insurance rather than protection? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that security is a very difficult issue and it's also a field that has a ton of money in it right now and companies pay a ton of money for security products and it just might be a lot easier for certain companies, certain organizations to 
just say, give me the cyber insurance, I'll deal with that. I don't want to have to go through the process of setting up like a security product, having a security team. Another option that they'll do is they'll outsource their security to a, um, a company, which is, it's great. Um, but it just depends on, I think, their level of knowledge of security and their level of knowledge of what's happening. Right. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Any more questions? Thank you guys for coming on for the virtual Nerd Summit. It's very cool that Nerd did this. Yeah, thank you so much. It seemed to work really well. So I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to pull it off. Yeah, totally.